All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to, well, I guess this is our third One Health seminar of this semester. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the earlier seminars and that you'll be sticking with us for the rest of the semester as well. Uh, a little bit about One Health before we get to our speaker this evening. Again, One Health is a transdisciplinary systems approach that is recognizing that, uh, you know, we're all in this together. People, uh, animals, plants, the environment, uh, we interact with each other in positive and negative ways. Uh, and that, you know, problems really need to be addressed from a transdisciplinary approach. And that's whether it's problems that are at our local level or whether we're looking at it from a national point of view or internationally. Uh, certainly COVID has uh, impressed upon all of us the, well, the risks that are out there from things spilling over from wildlife and affecting humans. Uh, and in turn, we're seeing them affect our, our domestic animals and other wild animals. And uh, while these are purely health kind of issues, there are a whole array of other things going on which affect the well being of each of these members of the triad. At Del Val, we're trying to uh, bring One Health into all that we do. Uh, we're doing that from three basic points of view one is education. And so all of our students within their freshman year are introduced to the concept of One Health. Uh, and through many courses, there may be more or less of a focus on uh, the need for a One Health approach to, to the problems that we're facing and the problems that you will be facing within your careers. Uh, we also are encouraging research and trying to uh, get more faculty and students to be addressing problems for more of a transdisciplinary approach. And then finally, outreach, and that's what this seminar series is all about, is outreach not only to all of the students on campus, but to our community as well. Uh, and uh, as I said, you know, this is our third seminar. We've got three more seminars coming up this year or this fall. Uh, we do six seminars each semester. Uh, many of these, and as this one will be, uh, recorded and are posted at uh, www.delval dot edu uh, forward slash one health. Uh, and so you can see the recordings there from from past presentations. And Larry's presentation tonight will ultimately show up there as well. Uh, so if you really enjoy this and you want friends to get a chance to enjoy it who couldn't be there tonight, uh, please pass this on to them. Uh, with this, I will turn it over to our presenter this evening. Larry Niles. Thank you, Larry, for being here. Uh, thanks, Reg, and uh, welcome everyone to the talk. Uh, I'm pleased to present to this interdisciplinary group. It's something that uh, I think is probably the most important thing that you'll learn in school, that uh, rarely do we get to work in a single line We uh, to, to do things. we have to collaborate and uh, over my career, uh, that collaboration has gotten more uh, intense and more interesting because uh, you're starting to uh, relate your expertise with that of other people. It just becomes more productive that way. I, uh, I did my PhD in, uh, at Rutgers on migratory raptors. Uh, I was, uh, the head of the New Jersey's Endangered Species Program for about 20 years. Uh, and then about uh, 15 years ago, I started my own company, small, it's just a, a small partnership, but uh, we all, we, all of our uh, work are projects. So we develop projects and then uh, we work with agencies or uh, groups, conservation groups to uh, carry out those projects. So that ranges from doing the restoration of sandy beaches and uh, intertidal marsh, where I'm working with hydrologists and engineers. And uh, so that's very interdisciplinary work. Uh, but I also conduct um, research on, uh, mostly on birds, uh, on horseshoe crabs, and uh, all of it sort of can be summed up as 
uh, work that relates to estuaries. So uh, I spend a lot of my time on Delaware Bay, uh, but we do work in uh, Bay of Lomas and uh, in Chile, Terra del Fuego, uh, in a huge wetland in northern Brazil. We've done work in the Arctic and so on. So I'm going to get started here. So can you see that all right, Rich? Yep, you're good. <clears throat> so tonight I'm going to uh, talk about our work on a migratory shorebird, an Arctic nesting shorebird that migrates uh, all the way down North America, all the way down to South America, and then it comes back and it uh, stops over in various places, one of which is Delaware Bay, where it feeds on horseshoe crabs, and horseshoe crab eggs. So, um, so first I'm going to talk about the horseshoe crab and their status, and then I'll talk about the knot ecology and status. Then I'll sort of finish with the ecosystem values of crabs and, and then their conservation. So the status of horseshoe crabs. Delaware Bay is, excuse me, is one of the largest horseshoe crab population, is the largest uh, horseshoe crab population in the world. Uh, most of the small populations have been lost in other places in the world and mostly in Southeast Asia. Uh, but the US, uh, the East Coast of the US has scattered uh, horseshoe crab populations in most estuaries. <clears throat> so they're uh, an ubiquitous species. Uh, you can see here that there, uh, there were populations in Southeast Asia. Most of them have been lost because of over harvest and I'll talk later about their value, the value of horseshoe crab blood for uh, a chemical called uh, lysate. Uh, but see, most of the crabs now are on the US East Coast. And the, as I said, the biggest population is the Delaware Bay. Now, horseshoe crabs were always abundant and in unimaginable numbers. Uh, there were so many horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay during the, uh, uh, the time when there were no chemical fertilizers. And because there, uh, there was no use for them, like you can't eat a horseshoe crab, it's, it's mostly just a shell. Um, they were using it for fertilizer. So they were just, uh, you know, killing millions of crabs, uh, composting them and then using them on uh, farm fields. That all ended when commercial or uh, chemical fertilizers based on petroleum started in the early 1950s. Uh, what's wrong right here? So uh, we had a, a, like that population of horseshoe crabs that was sort of abused all the way up until the 50s suddenly blossomed because nobody was killing them anymore. They were essentially worthless in the eyes of the people who lived in the area and to uh, commercial fishers. And uh, but then in the early 1990s, the uh, crab became important as bait to catch other species. So um, at first, it was the New England fishermen were coming down into Delaware Bay. And you could see they were they were coming in right around this point, and uh, up until that point, there were only about hundred thousand or so crabs taken a year. Very quickly, it rose up to over two point five million a year. And see, the horseshoe crab doesn't uh, mature until it's nine years old. So when you heavily harvest an animal like this, it takes a, a long time for the population to recover. Uh, but uh, the problem here is that they wouldn't relent. And the problem there was larger because the reason New England fishermen were coming down for bait is because they had depleted 
the cod and the other species associated with the ground fish of New England. And so they were looking for something else to, to essentially destroy. And, uh, and so they started fishing for the uh, conks, like whelks, the, you know, the, the species that you hold a show up here, here and here in the ocean. They suddenly became valuable because they were shipping the flesh overseas. And so they needed bait to catch them and they started taking crabs. So very quickly, the, that fishery spread down the East Coast and before long, everybody wanted to kill crabs. While that was going on, there was a, a relatively small industry of uh, companies that were bleeding horseshoe crabs. And they were, they were bleeding them because within the blood of horseshoe crabs is this uh, biochemical called lysate that is used in everything that go medical device, every drug, everything that goes into your body medical is tested with lysate for biocontaminants. Like uh, drug companies like Eli Lilly will use lysate to test the water, they'll test the various chemical chemicals that go into a drug. They'll test the final drug when it finally gets to the market. And see, most of the use is in that early stage, like 90% of the use of LAL is, is just, you know, trying to make sure the water's not contaminated. But this is a huge industry. So uh, where uh, the bait fishery may be worth at its peak, not more than a few million dollars. This is worth three, four hundred million dollars. And uh, most of these companies have been bought up by international companies. And so, and, and they, they basically are falling in under the same rules as fishers, commercial fishermen, uh, which uh, means that they can protect all of their data. They can keep it from the public. Uh, nobody can really review their methods. Uh, like they say that they're only killing about 15% uh, of the animals that they bleed. Independent studies where they replicated the methods used by these companies say the number is closer to 30%. So basically killing one out of every three crabs that they bleed which is like killing the golden goose because a crab can be bled for all of its life if you only take a, a minor portion of their blood and if you take care of them while you're bleeding them. But what they do instead is they use a heart puncture into the heart of the crab and they take everything that will drain out of the heart. And then, you know, if the crab's still uh, moving, then they put it back in the water and say that everything's all right. But studies have shown that crabs that are bled often have long-term impacts, like they fail to breed or they die after they're released. So this is an important use, but uh, the companies are taking advantage of their, of their uh, role in human health by abusing this public trust resource. Now, to just give you an idea of what the role of horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay, because this, this is sort of the heart of the talk. See, when horseshoe crabs are at a, uh, a great density, then what happens is every new crab that comes into the beach lays her eggs about six inches deep. And when you have a few crabs, then, you know, you have a egg mass laid here, an egg mass laid there, and they mostly stay in the sand. But when you have a lot of crabs, then eventually the beach becomes saturated. And then every new crab that comes in to lay eggs unearths eggs. Uh, and so they come to the surface. So before they over harvested crabs, this is the egg resource on Delaware Bay. These eggs were feeding birds but most of these eggs were going into the 
see. And I'll talk about that a little later. So that's what it looked like before they over harvested crab. This is what it looks, sorry. This is what it looks like now. So there's still more crabs in Delaware Bay than anywhere else. But if we have a good year, it might look like this. Like last year, we didn't even have eggs until uh, late. And so, uh, you know, then it began this 20 year battle with a fishery system that is essentially broken. I mean, most of the species that people care about, like the recreational species, like stripers, weak fish, flounder, most of them are either depleted or overfished. And see, when we first got into the battle over horseshoe crabs, we thought it was about horseshoe crabs, but it was really a, a sort of symptom of this broken uh, system of managing fisheries on US East Coast. So, Finally, we reined them in and they stopped the massive killing. But you could see that all the efforts to try to restore the crabs have failed. So this is the number of crabs in an offshore trawl. And uh, this is just catch per toe. So the numbers don't really mean anything. What's important is the trend. And you can see that there is no trend. This is the most recent year, 2019. And see, this is the eggs. This is what it looked like. This is where the eggs were in that first video. So somewhere around 45,000 per square meter. So think about that, a square meter, about a square yard, there were 45,000 eggs on the surface. And see, this is where we are now and it hasn't gotten any better. So, uh, and see, there are more threats than just people killing crabs. And uh, one of them is like last year, because when you cut the population of horseshoe crabs down to the level that we have right now, the spawning peak, the peak of spawning is very brief. And so if it doesn't occur at exactly the right time, then the birds that are coming in to feed on them can't because they're they come and they go. I'll talk about this as I get into the red knots. But last year, for example, this is counterintuitive because you would expect the opposite with the effects of climate change. But last year, the water temperature never got above uh, the threshold needed to elicit spawning until early June. Usually it's early May. So the whole spawn was delayed by about two weeks, and that was just enough to put it outside of the period when migrant birds come to the bay. There's a lot of issues here. <clears throat> so I like to talk about the uh, red knot for a while. See, what we we've been studying red knot since uh, the late '90s. Our work is mostly uh, we do a lot of surveys, um, but we also catch birds. And that creates a lot of opportunity because if you have a bird in the hand, then you could start, you know, you could put on transmitters, you can take blood and study that, you can take feathers and study that. So, and the way we catch shorebirds is with cannon nets. So you can see here, uh, the cannons are on uh, right here. Uh, it's a big explosive charge. Um, and these are the metal projectiles and that pulls out this net. And so you need something like this because shorebirds are so fast that if you don't use a net that gets over them quickly, then either you're not gonna catch them or you're gonna hurt them because the, the leading edge, the leading edge of the net has to be well over them before they fly up or else they'll be killed by the net. We kill very few shorebirds, and those that we do end up as part of studies for contaminants and other research. Uh, something that we're doing a lot of right now is we're attaching uh, these new, very small satellite transmitters. So uh, the problem with a lot of shorebirds is that they're so small that you can't get a big 
transmitter on them because they, you know, would affect their uh, their survival. But now transmitters are getting so small that uh, we can track birds in real time. It's been a huge uh, improvement in our ability to understand individ understand the species because now you can better understand uh, the, the lives of individuals. See, a, a lot of wildlife science is trying to understand what's going on with the species by studying the population in your area, wherever that may be. And there's, uh, that's valuable, but it's uh, more valuable when you can understand the uh, ecology of individuals. And so that's what we're getting into more and more now. So red knots are one of the longest distance migrants of all species. So, uh, and they, you, when you're thinking about Arctic nesting birds, you look at the earth from the top down. So these birds are breeding in various Arctic habitat uh, at the, the surrounding the North Pole. Like our, most of our work was uh, in this area, Southampton Island, uh, Victoria Island. Uh, and But see, there's other uh, subspecies of red knots that migrate all the way down to New Zealand. Uh, there's species that migrate all the way down to South Africa. And then ours, Rufa, goes all the way down to Terra del Fuego. Now, there's smaller groups that winter. So in other words, they're wintering here, and they go all the way down here to spend their, sorry, they breed here and they go all the way down here to winter. But there are smaller populations that winter in other locations. I'll talk about some of this. So here's a, a, uh, uh, the results of a <clears throat> bird that we tagged with a device called a geolocator. So these were before we had the satellite transmitters and uh, the, it, it, you have to you attach the uh, one gram uh, geolocator to the leg on a leg flag, and all it does is measure light, and it records it so that when you recapture the bird, you can download the information, and just like you use a sextant, you can basically determine the position of the bird uh, throughout its flight. So. You see this bird started out, we, we tagged it in Delaware Bay, but you see it went up to its Arctic breeding area, went all the way down to South America, and then it went back. But see, what's interesting about this is some of these flights are truly amazing. I mean, one bird uh, went, flew for seven days straight, didn't stop, just left, uh, stop over down here, Lago de Pesce in southern Brazil, and flew directly to Delaware Bay. Took it seven days. But see, the way these animals do this is they pack on fat. So they fly from breeding area to wintering area, but in between they stop at places and they rebuild. So that's why horseshoe crabs in Delaware Bay are so important because most of them are coming to Delaware Bay to rebuild fat. And then uh, they use that to get, make the last leg of the journey where they, that fat helps them start their breeding because when they get up there, it's still cold and there's not much prey for them to feed on. But this happens in multiple places, like a bird in, in Lagoa de Pesh will build up fat and spend it all getting to Delaware Bay. That's what these birds are about. And it's, it's kind of ugly, but you can see how much fat they're putting on. Like they're, they're packing on fat in all the places that they can do it, but they're also reducing the size of their, when they're getting close, ready to fly, they start reducing the size of their stomach and their uh, intestines so that they can pack on even more fat. So when they, get to a stopover like Delaware Bay, the advantage of eggs is that they can very quickly start digesting again because the eggs of horseshoe crabs don't require that much digestion. And so they rebuild their stomach, their intestines, they build up fat like this, like a bird will come in at 
120 grams and leave Delaware Bay at 200 grams. And, and then they'll go on. So this is what, uh, it's a bird that is probably, this is late in the season too. So this bird probably was either gonna die on the way or turn around, or if it got to the Arctic, it would probably fail to breed. This is a nice fat bird that will probably get to the Arctic and breed. So Delaware Bay is the most important stopover. Uh, it has, uh, after the harvest of, over harvest of horseshoe crabs, the numbers plummeted because now there were a lot of birds coming to Delaware Bay and there weren't enough eggs. And so there's a lot more competition, a lot more birds not failing, or a lot more birds failing to gain weight. And so they were trying to get to the Arctic and dying. So, you know, we had one time we had uh, 90,000 red knots in Delaware Bay. Uh, now we're at about uh, 10 to 20,000. Uh, the last few years we've had an increase. I'll explain that later. But see, there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, but Delaware Bay is just probably the most perfect place for migrating shorebirds, not only because of the horseshoe crab, but because of all of its other characteristics, its beaches, and it's a it's not ocean waves. It's relatively calm, except in storms. Now these other numbers that I'm showing here, the um, see we do both aerial counts and we do ground counts. So it's just a comparison of the two. Uh, this takes a little explanation. So we calculate what percentage of birds make weight, good weight? Like we estimate that birds have to make at least 180 grams to get to the Arctic to breed successfully. And uh, you can see uh, at the beginning, we were up around 90%. So in other words, almost all birds got to the right weight and left for the Arctic. And then as the crabs were over harvested, that number plummeted. So it got so low that most of the birds couldn't gain weight. And then as the birds started dying off, there were less birds going for the smaller number of eggs. And that, so the percentage of birds started that gained weight increased, but you can see that we're not getting anywhere, just staying at that uh, mid, uh, about 50%. So just for interest, I'm gonna describe something about their other places. So this is uh, where most of the red knots went to winter was a place called uh, Bay of Lomas in Terra del Fuego in Chile. There's another small stop uh, wintering area in Argentina close to Bay of Lomas, but most of them were in Bay of Lomas. And you can see in this flock here, there's red nuts, but you can also see there's Hudsonian codwit. So this is a really important wintering area for both species. So it's located right at the very tip. This is Cape Horn down here. Uh, Bay of Lomas is right here. See where it is relative to. <clears throat> so essentially what these, uh, Bay of Lomas has a 30 foot in, uh, tide. So in other words, you know, every six hours, it's it's going uh, 30 feet one way or the other. That's what makes it so good for the birds because there's an intertidal shelf in Bahia Lomas that's six or five miles wide. So the tide's slowly coming in over that five mile area and slowly going out so that the birds just follow the tide out and then they follow it back in feeding the whole time. And they're, uh, during the winter, their needs are pretty minor. They just basically have to eat enough to you know, meet their metabolic needs. And they don't wanna build up weight because the more weight a bird carries, the more likely it is to be uh, killed by a predator, a avian predator, like a peregrine falcon. So uh, typically they stay right in the area of about 140 grams or so until they're ready to migrate, and then they start building up the weight. Here you can see uh, a flock out at the edge of the tide, There's two people. 
So uh, we we uh, went to Terra del Fuego first time in 2000 because the fishers here, the Marine Fish Agency, were saying, hey, the problem isn't with uh, Delaware Bay and Horseshoe Crocs, the problem's in uh, South America. And so we went to South America and we proved that there was no problem there, that the problem was Delaware Bay. The decline of red knots in Bay Alumas paralleled Delaware Bay over the years. So the birds leave uh, Terra del Fuego in late uh, February, March, and they hop up the South American coast. Uh, and it's a, a pretty easy migration because they're only going short distances. They're mostly eating clams, uh, mostly eating clams, which are not easy to digest. So they have to have their, you know, intact stomach and intestines to grind up the shells and get the flesh out of it. But they don't need much because they're just making short hops. Then they get to a place called Lagoda Pesh, which is right at the southern Brazil. It's about the same latitude as North Carolina. But see, now we're in the Austral Fall. And so uh, the uh, plants, but other vertebrates are at their highest density. So the birds can now feed in just a, a small area and just gobble up uh, small clams. They're not as good as horseshoe crab eggs, but they build up weight. Like we went there two years ago, we, we couldn't go there last year because of COVID um, or this year for that matter. Uh, but um, uh, they gain weight at the uh, up to 200, we caught one bird that was uh, 240 grams. So they're gaining a huge amount of weight. And then from here, they're lifting off to uh, Delaware Bay. So this is what it looks like. It's uh, it's called the Goa Depeche National Park. Uh, it's located uh, right at the right near the border with Uruguay, and uh, it's a really nice place. It's uh, it's uh, very remote. Uh, it's uh, relatively uh, it's relatively clean. <laughs> the water is good. The the uh, you know, it's a nice place to visit and it's a nice place to do work. Like we've done work in Northern Brazil, which is right at the equator. And that's a very bad place, bad water, uh, lots of disease, uh, but this is a very pleasant place to work. Now it's under threat because the president of Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro is uh, similar to our president Trump. He's uh, undermining a lot of the environmental rules. Uh, what he's done here is uh, replace the park superintendent with a political person who's trying to uh, take away the national park designation. It hasn't yet, but it's under threat. And here are the difficulties are, uh, there are a lot. There's uh, the fishers are using, commercial fishers are using the beach as a way to get from uh, the access road near town uh, 20 kilometers south to the place where there's a, a robust uh, fishery for small shrimp. And uh, so there's a lot of disturbance from them riding up and down. Uh, but there's another problem here that uh, we just have not, we, we're actually funded to figure out the problem, but because of COVID, we haven't been able to do the work. Uh, birds are dying and uh, it's not clear why they're dying. It could be contaminants in the water because the agriculture on the mainland, like this area is remote, but the agriculture on the mainland is uh, really large scale agriculture. It's similar to what you might see in Texas. Big machines, lots of chemicals, lots of uh, you know, abuse of the land. And uh, so that's one possibility, uh, but there are others. And so it's weakening, whatever it is, it's weakening the birds. And so that even scavengers like Taracaras are killing them, which is, uh, you know, makes it really tough to figure out what's going on because uh, there is no carcass to examine. 
So that's a big problem there. So birds come up, they go to Delaware Bay, they go up to the Arctic to breed, then they come back south, you know, to head back to South America again. And now they're in the North American fall, time of abundance. So it's similar to the northbound when they're coming out of Bay of Lomas to uh, Lagoda Pesh. Uh, except here the problem is like they're coming through in August. So just think about the Jersey Shore in August. And uh, a lot of the places that the birds are uh, need to stop over where the clams are very abundant because there is no horseshoe crabs are done spawning. There's no horseshoe crab eggs uh, are also places where there's abundant people. So that's another serious issue. Uh, it's interesting from a ecological perspective because there's essentially two types of shorebirds, uh, two, two populations, I should say. Uh, one is the long distance birds that are going all the way to South America. The other is short distance birds that are wintering in Florida and the Caribbean. And see, we can tell the long distance birds because they don't molt their flight feathers. The, short distance birds molt their flight feathers in the, the stopover. So the birds are uh, easily distinguished. We also see a lot of juveniles. And so you can see a uh, juvenile has these really uh, uh, beautiful, newly um, malted feathers. So you, you know, you can see this subterminal band right here. That's a key indicator of a juvenile red knot. This is the result of one of the uh, uh, birds that we put the satellite transmitter on. Uh, it went to Northern Brazil. We think that it ended up in Terra del Fuego, but the battery on the satellite transmitter ran out at that point. But so you could see how difficult it is. So not only do they have the issues of August in the you know, mid-Atlantic coast, but this is the time of tropical storms and hurricanes as well. And, you know, they're just moving right through here. So we've had birds that with geolocators that were heading south in Canada, a uh, tropical storm. And they, one bird almost reached Africa. It went so far out of its way to get back to the, the land. So I just want to finish with uh, shorebirds. The eggs of horseshoe crabs were important to shorebirds. That's what drove this whole battle. Eventually, the red knot was listed as a federal endangered uh, threatened species. And so that changed everything. That made a, a regulatory weight for the birds that didn't exist before. And so that uh, you know changed the story. But see, what we didn't understand is that most of the eggs that were in this, that when a fully fledged, I mean, a fully stocked horseshoe crab population, most of those were going into the sea. And then once these eggs hatched, all these young were going into the sea. This is in July. And see here, you could see minnows coming in and feeding on these young horseshoe crabs. You see, horseshoe crabs were the basis of a productive ecosystem. That's what uh, most of the fisheries agencies won't recognize that there's not there's a great value to horseshoe crabs, not just bait. So we've done studies where uh, there has been studies done where has shown that most of the fish of the mid-Atlantic coast are feeding on horseshoe crab eggs or they're young. And so as evidence of this, the wheat fish, which used to be abundant in Delaware Bay, crashed almost at the same, at the same time as horseshoe crabs. So horseshoe crabs are very important. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. So uh, recognizing that larger issue, that it isn't just about birds, uh, horseshoe crabs, are a meaningful part of productive, productive estuarine systems. We started a coalition called the Horseshoe Crab Recovery Coalition 
that now numbers over 30 different groups, including National Audubon, National Wildlife Federation, and a very diverse group like Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Uh, Eli Lilly is part of our uh, group because we're fighting to uh, implement uh, a new uh, version of LAL, which is a synthetic version called RFC. And uh, so the, the goal of our coalition is to stop the killing, the wasteful killing. Like there, there's no reason to use crabs for bait. There's no reason to kill crabs for their blood. You could still take blood and not kill the crab. So that's, that's our first goal. The second is that we're trying to implement this synthetic glycate, uh, RFC, with great success. We're, we just, uh, uh, there are a number of companies now using, Eli Lilly uses the synthetic version uh, for all of its processing now, and they've started introducing new products with RFC. And, their uh, anti antibody uh, vaccine that they've created, the COVID antibody um, vaccine is now tested with RFC. So a lot of our effort is to, uh, to convince the US Pharmacopeia, which is the group that uh, approves uh, these sort of testing procedures to adopt RFC as an equivalent to LAL. They've already done it in Europe. They're about to do it in Asia. Uh, US is not doing it, and there's some pretty corrupted reasons for that. Uh, and, and then uh, the last goal is to uh, bring in as many people as we can into this coalition as a uh, unified voice to restore horseshoe crabs, not just in Delaware Bay, but in all the places where they occur. So our coalition is groups that go from Georgia to Massachusetts. And our goal is to work on every single small uh, population of horseshoe crabs that occur. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh... For those uh, out there, uh, if you have questions, please put those into the Q&A. Uh, I see that we have a question there now. And Larry, this is from Anonymous. Uh, why is it that I tend to find many beached horseshoe crabs in Wildwood during the summer? Is that normal or is something to be concerned about? Uh, both. <laughs> the, uh, there are horseshoe crab populations in uh, Cape May Harbor. And when they, they, they come into the, uh, to Cape May and into the Hereford Inlet and they spawn in the place where they can. And then they uh, winter out in the uh, you know, intercontinental shelf. So if a crab dies out there, then it's gonna wash ashore. So it could be that. It could also be that there's a lot of uh, destructive fisheries going on, like there's clam dredges and scallop dredges and bottom trawls. And so they're, they're uh, killing a lot of crabs. And so uh, it could have come from that. Uh, you know, people are bringing up their uh, prey, whatever it is, say clams, and there's crabs in there too. And so they're killing a lot, uh, it's called bycatch. They're killing a lot that way. So it's hard to tell uh, what the reason is. Could be good. I mean, could just natural, could be bad. Uh, we have another question, Larry. This is from Judy and it's, how does the population of red knots affect us and or other species around them? I think that's a good question. It's, you know, an often asked question. And I think this points out the value. See, when we started out, it was about red knot. But then as we got into it, we could see it was about estuaries. And see, an estuarine system, like if we 
if we harvest all that is produced in an estuarine system, then eventually you, you chip away essentially the capital. And once you get below that, then the population gets less and less productive. So, you know, uh, the people who are taking crabs will say, you know, it's about jobs, but it's not about jobs. It's about managing a, a nesturing system for its maximum productivity, which is fully stocked. Like there's no reason to keep horseshoe crabs at half the population because it's not that you're just that, that it's producing half the number of mature adults every year. Like if you take that population, say it's creating 10 new adults every year and you allow it to get to its ecological carrying capacity, the capacity of an estuarine system, you might be creating a hundred crabs per year. And see what we're doing now is we keep, keep all these systems at a very low level of productivity and that doesn't help anybody. And see the, the birds are a good indicator of that because we wouldn't have, nobody would have be fighting for the productivity of these estuarine systems if it wasn't for the red knot because that was sort of the canary in the coal mine that was telling us that there was something wrong. And that when you, we dug into it, it wasn't just something wrong with the species, it's wrong, something wrong with each of the estuarine systems of which it, it, it uh, uses as part of its ecology. I think that's the, the main value. I, I could say to you the sort of normal answer is, you know, a, a, ecological system is like a one of those you know stacks of blocks that you keep pulling the one block out to see which is the last one that makes the whole thing collapse that's the way a lot of our ecosystems are right now we we keep pulling out blocks and you know we don't know when that last block is and the whole thing falls and you know see what happened in Delaware Bay is a good example of this. they kept pulling out the blocks and the crab population went down, the fish population went down. Now all the communities along the bay shore are impoverished because there's no more fish to catch. So there's no more marinas, there's no more restaurants. And so all the economy, these small rural towns is now uh, impoverished because we mismanaged a, a estuarine ecosystem. So I think that's the best answer, but there's others. We have another question, I hope I pronounced this correctly, uh, from Thesa. Uh, didn't New Jersey pass a law against using the eggs for bait? Uh, no, it's better than that. That's a good question. They, uh, New Jersey has a moratorium on killing crabs. And so uh, and, uh, we were a big part of that uh, moratorium. But what the agencies did, the fisheries agencies, is so there's a quota for horseshoe crab, 500,000 male only. And New Jersey had a portion of that quota and with the moratorium, we gave it up. And so it should have decreased the kill. But what the fishery agencies did would transfer that to Maryland. So it's sort of a wash. It's, it's good because it's protecting all the small populations of horseshoe crabs along New Jersey coast, but it didn't help Delaware Bay as much as we had hoped because they just redistributed the kill. We have another question from Judy. Uh, what are things we can do locally to help horseshoe crabs? Uh, first of all, if you, we're talking about the mid-Atlantic, uh, there's, I'll say it in sort of stages. The first is we have this horseshoe crab coalition. Uh, our action this year is to start a science and stewardship effort where we're engaging volunteers in a coastwide Georgia to Massachusetts survey of horseshoe crab. Uh, it's, it'll be directed by uh, conservation groups all along the, the coast. And so you can take part in that. Um, on Delaware Bay, almost all of our projects are volunteer oriented. So we have 
volunteers helping us work on birds. We have volunteers uh, that steward the beaches to stop people from disturbing the birds and explaining to them why. There, we have a volunteer system that of uh, a group of volunteers that go out and rescue crabs that are uh, impinged in bulkheads or overturned by waves. So there's a variety of ways to get involved. Uh, maybe I could give you more information, Reg, and then you can distribute that. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. I think, you know, if people just go to your, your website that you talked about, uh, they can find out who the partners are and maybe uh, see an organization that's near them too. Right, it's called the Horseshoe Crab, Crab Recovery Coalition. Dot org, right? Uh, yes, it's actually, uh, the uh, link is uh, hscrabrecovery.org, yeah. H Uh, so we have another question. Uh, again, what kind of medical procedures is lysate used for? Uh, so, for example, every COVID vaccine is tested by lysate. Uh, so basically everything that, uh, you know, hip implants, uh, injectable drugs, uh, oral drugs, everything that goes into your body medical is tested by uh, with LAL or RFC now. Uh, see, they used to do it with rabbits and uh, see, that was clearly inhumane. And so uh, bleeding horseshoe crabs was a step forward in uh, you know humane treatment of animals. But now there's a synthetic so we could move on from that. We have a, a question from one of our alums. Hi, Mary. Uh, is captive breeding of horseshoe crabs a viable option? Uh, it's happening. There are people doing it, but it's mostly a money making. You know, it's it's it, it's a way of avoiding the the real problem. The real problem here is that people are killing crabs and you know breeding them in a pond. Uh, it may relieve one portion of it, but just think about it. Like the, the uh, one project is in Georgia. I think they're trying to gear up to 10,000 crabs, but every year there's about uh, 600,000 crabs bled. So it's not a viable alternative. And the thing is, that's not really not the point because we can. We can, you know, we have RFC and so I'm promoting that, but these companies could be responsible. They, they could take less blood per crab. They could take better care of the crabs when they're, they, they could reduce their mortality down to zero if they wanted. And they're making so much money from this. I mean, our estimate, uh, we, we can't know how much money they're making because they won't share any of their data. But we carried out a process uh, knowing that one quart of lysate is worth $29,000. So then we backed up from there and we estimated that one year's blood from a horseshoe crab is worth, of a female is worth over $300. So they're making gobs of money here. They could be putting money into conservation they could be, they could help us get the carry capacity within 10 years, but you know, it's all international companies and they're just taking everything they can unless somebody stops them. Uh, another question from Anonymous. Uh, have you noticed that red knots are trying to adapt to the lack of horseshoe crab eggs and eating other things such as more clams? Yeah, there, I mean, that's, uh, in most of the other flyways, red knots are feeding on uh, clams. Uh, but see, the circumstances are different uh, because the abundance of clams is, is far different. Uh, the area of habitat that they can forage in is far different. And 
this population, see, when it first started, when we first began our work, we estimated there were about uh, 100,000 red knots. And about 80% of them were in South America, wintering in South America. Now, after the decline, and see, that was all based on horseshoe crab, because uh, that allowed them to make these major migrations and get to the Arctic. And the ecological strategy we think is that in the Arctic, they have very few diseases and parasites. In Terra del Fuego, they have very few diseases and parasites. So that uh, it's only the journey in between. And from an, an evolutionary perspective, there was greater fitness by making that long migration because they were staying safe from parasites and diseases. See, now that the population has been, uh, in Terra del Fuego has been reduced by, you know, 70, 80%, there's a much greater percentage of the population is wintering in Caribbean and Florida. And those birds are uh, always susceptible of the red tide, like the birds that are dying in Lagoa de Peche, like they're, uh, the birds are susceptible. And so with, if, if uh, things go right, we'll uh, keep this long distance population and gradually grow it back again once the horseshoe crabs start coming back. Uh, uh, but the other possibility is that we'll lose the long distance population, we'll be relying on the short distance population, which could be lost in a, it, like uh, uh, last year, there was a red tide event in Florida that lasted for uh, a month and a half and it was killing red knots and Sandra, all the shorebirds. So, you know, what we'll achieve is, is we'll have a population that will uh, persist, but it could be lost any year. So it just makes the species less likely to survive. Uh, we have a question here from Claudia, and I think she's referring to that we, we've been talking about uh, fatalities of the horseshoe crabs from other things. Uh, she asks, is it equally dangerous and fatal to them since they can't flip themselves back over? Uh, I noticed this in Chincoteague a few years ago on a vacation and helped as many out as I could. Yeah, it's a, see when the population's so low, every time you flip over a, clab, a crab, you're having a, a significant effect. In a fully stocked carrying capacity population, those overturned crabs become part of the system of nutrients that all the other species are depending on. So if, if, there's, if, if we have a carrying capacity population, you're gonna have a lot of dead crabs, just like you have a lot of dead salmon, just like a lot of species depend on that kind of uh, system. Uh, as the population was reduced down to where it is now, we can't afford that. And so that's why we started the program of overturning crabs to try to jumpstart the population and get it back up high again. It's a good question. It's hard to answer, but I would say that, uh, that turning over crabs is a good thing. Every little bit helps, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, from uh, Aubrey, we've got, will global warming affect the red knots migration? And if so, would that affect the horseshoe crab populations in a significant way? Uh, yeah, uh, unrelated to the two because they're each uh, feeling the effect of climate change in different ways. Uh, for example, we just really came present to the reality that, see, we're looking at uh, the impacts of climate change is sea level rise, uh, which is true. It's, uh, Delaware Bay is one of the fastest rising uh, water bodies on the East Coast, uh, about four millimeters a year. But what we realized this year is that there's no more ice. And see, without ice, then the winter storms are just pounding the sandy beaches, taking away the sand 
so that there's not horseshoe crab habitat, spawning habitat anymore. Uh, last year, uh, we had, um, as I explained, the water temperature was cold. That's counterintuitive, but the reason that it's cold is because the Gulf Stream is slowing down. So that's allowing more uh, colder weather to persist in the spring. For red knots, the, uh, like last May, it was the first time I heard of a, a tropical, we had two tropical storms in May. And so these birds are flying from South America to here and they had to go through two tropical storms. And so that just wrecked the timing for a lot of birds and probably increased mortality. Uh, so there's a, and the birds also are suffering at the other end because they're in the Arctic. And so we actually did a project modeling the impacts of climate change on Arctic breeding areas and essentially everything moving northward. And so there's birds at the end of the line there because you can't move any further north. And so, you know, eventually they're going to be squeezed out you know, as they're being pushed north. So yeah, there's a lot of impacts here. God knows what will be the outcome. Uh, we're, we're actually out of time here, but I, I kind of would like to combine a couple of questions and maybe a, a thought that I had as well. So from Michael, uh, he said, I know you said the red knot was recognized as threatened within the United States since its migratory range is so vast. Is it internationally considered a threatened species or only in the US? And then Elisha asked, uh, have you worked with an, any environmental activists on the ground in Brazil to counter the habitat threats there? And I would throw in, uh, where does the International Migratory Bird Treaty or Ramsar Convention fall into all of this? Um, so- Good question, huh? Yeah. <laughs> what was the first one again? <laughs> the first one was about uh, whether they're listed elsewhere. Oh, yeah. um, so they're listed in Canada. Uh, they're listed in Brazil and they're listed in Argentina. Chile doesn't have a, a system for listing. Um, so yes, they're, they're recognized within each of the countries. Uh, some uh, like Brazil have very little laws. Uh, surrounding that, but countries like U.S. and Canada have a lot. Um, I, I, just for the brevity of the talk, I didn't talk about our collaboration, but we're working uh, with two universities in Lagoa Pesh. Uh, we're working with two universities in northern Brazil. We work with the University of Santo Tomas in Chile. So all of our work involves like uh, what we normally bring to the circumstances money because uh, most of the money is coming from US sources. Uh, but we also bring our expertise from the long work that we've done on shorebirds and estuaries and so on. And, and so we plug into their existing uh, conservation efforts. So, uh, it, it, uh, and we always defer to uh, the local group. Uh, the international system, they don't work very well. I mean, Ramsar is good, it, 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 and it probably works a lot better in, in uh, countries with very little protection. Uh, but in the places that we work in, it's simply a, a uh, you know, a, a designation. Uh, but it doesn't affect the uh, killing of animals or the it has no teeth behind it. Uh, the International Migratory Bird Treaty is extraordinarily important for a lot of reasons. It prevents uh, companies from damaging, uh, you know, uh, species that are in migration during migration. It doesn't have much effect uh, when you're trying to conserve a place you know, in Brazil or in Delaware Bay, it doesn't really have that much impact, which is not to say it's not important. It's sort of that underlying bedrock of protection uh, that gives species, you know, sort of the, the lowest level 
but we're we're trying to act at uh, a more intense level, trying to protect habitat and so on. Well, this has been great, Larry. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that we're out of time and we didn't get to everybody's questions, but I, I think that you would all agree, and certainly by the number of questions that we did have, uh, this has stimulated a lot of thought and a lot of interest. Uh, I really appreciate all of you who attended tonight, and thank you so much, Larry. Uh, this has been great. Uh, for those who have been coming to our One Health seminars, our next seminar is gonna be on the 23rd of March, a Tuesday, and it'll be about American chestnut restoration. So hopefully you'll join us then. And thank you, I enjoyed it. Thank you, Larry. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night.